up, everybody? Jimmy Smith doing my post-fight breakdown UFC 245. I did the post-fight show on SiriusXM this morning at 3 o'clock, so I'm a little tired. But, excellent night of fights. Uh, I'll go over now what I, you know, the picks and what I believe each fighter, the statement each fighter made and where they're going. Because I think it's important. A lot of stock, stock went up last night. A lot of stock went down. Very, very interesting. Let's start out with Peter Jan versus Uriah Faber. Uriah Faber coming up short in dramatic fashion. Knocked out in the third round. The issue with Uriah Faber has always been he's athletic. He's explosive. I think he relies a little too much on those gifts once he's inside the octagon. What I mean by that is not necessarily super tight with the hands. Not crazy technical. Hands low explosive, darting in and out, darting side to side, kind of daring his opponent to come in and kind of throws big counter shots, stuff like that. The problem is that ha that has never carried him past the best of the best at 45 and 35. The really elite fighters kind of had the antidote for that kind of style. He was never technical enough to get past those guys. So what's changed? Jan's not a champion. Jan's not the best of the best. Excellent fighter who might be champion soon. But Uriah Faber had the same style he's always had, but he's 40. And it's not quite working. Jan took him apart. I thought Jan would beat him. I thought it would be because of the boxing, which it was. He was too tight. He was too strong, too powerful, bigger than Uriah Faber. And that athletic style was just not good enough to get past the spectacular offense of Jan. I didn't think Uriah Faber had much for him. Also, early on in his career... Which you have to remember, I saw Uriah Faber fight 20 years ago in California on the same kind of cards I was fighting on. And his wrestling was the difference maker back then. He really had great wrestling. Not great. I mean, he was a Division I guy, but he really had great MMA wrestling is a better way to put it. And that was always his equalizer and the difference maker. I think as the game has evolved, and that hasn't really been his ace in the hole. He hasn't been able to take guys down at will in a long time. So what? He relies on his striking, and that has made him rely on his the explosiveness that served him well in wrestling uh, has cost him a little bit when, it, when it's translated to the stand-up. So Jan ate him alive. Uh, the funny part was they were just doing kind of smiling at each other bro thing, and Jan dropped his ass uh, with some power punches and then finished him with a beautifully timed head kick. His face was a mess. I always wonder with comebacks, and I'm not a huge fan of comebacks, my broadcast partner this morning, R.J. Clifford, he's a big fan of comebacks, and I differ a little bit. Just because when someone comes back, especially at your favorite age, what are you going to do that you didn't do the first time around? What are you going to show me at 40 that you didn't show me at 25? Right? Your prime's only so long. What you did in your prime is pretty much what you're going to accomplish. So the question is, if you can't get as high as you were, what's the point in coming back? Where was Uriah Faber before his retirement? He was a perennial contender. He was always right there amongst the elite. Couldn't beat the best of the best, but always right there with him. He's not there anymore. He's not going to get there. Nothing's going to get him there. We saw that last night. Can he have interesting, entertaining fights at 135 pounds? Yes. A lot of people talking about a rematch with Jose Aldo. Okay. That would be an entertaining fight that would put asses in seats. Will he get to contender status again? No. He has enough money. He has Team Alpha Male. He doesn't need to do this unless he can accomplish more than he did in his first round. I think last night showed uh, without a doubt that he's not going to get there. He's not going to get back to contender status. Can he win fights? Yes. He's not going to get back to where he was before he retired. So what's, what's your goal, right? If you're not going to get back to where you were, what are you doing? And so that's my question because every camp takes so much out of you and every fight takes so much out of you. You don't work in an office, dude. So you're wearing down your body and your health and maybe your brain in order to not get back to where you were. I don't see that. So Jan moves up in contender status. I think he's got a lot of juice at 135 pounds. Might be next for a title shot. Depending on what works out with Henry Cejudo, nobody knows. But I think Jan is a, is a, is a name everyone's going to be thinking about when it comes to title shots. Moving out, 135 pounds as well. Marlon Moraes versus Jose Aldo. Uh, I was wrong on this pick. I picked Jose Aldo to win this. A lot of people thought he did. Very close fight. Come on. 
I, I, the people saying robbery and all this stuff, I, I don't get that at all. Round one, very, very close. Round two, definitely for Jose Aldo. Round three, very, very close. So, uh, obviously, the I haven't seen the judges' scorecards. They must have given Mar- Marlon Marais rounds one and three, and that's how we won. Okay, great. A couple things we learned. Jose Aldo still looks pretty good at 135 pounds. Uh, didn't take much out of him in terms of his performance. But the dynamic, explosive leg kick in, taking everybody out guy, is gone. Now, you could say, that guy's been gone for a while, Jimmy. Certainly. But there was the thought, and the hope, maybe, that a change in weight class would give him a little boost. And that he'd be at 135 pounds, maybe a little quicker and more explosive or whatever, and and knock guys out and kind of return to form. That's not going to happen. Is he an excellent 135 pounder? Yes. Could he have beaten Marlon Rice? That was a raised within decision. Of course he could have. That could have put him in title contention. He's right there at 135. So he can rattle off a couple of wins and, and get there. Certainly possible. But the old fire-breathing Jose Aldo is never coming back. But this new Jose Aldo, not new, the guy we've seen for the last few fights, can is good enough to maybe be a contender at 135 pounds. So Dana White said he believed Jose Aldo won the fight. Great. I don't think he can realistically put him against Henry Cejudo coming off a loss to Marlon Moraes. But that's bad news for Marlon Moraes. Meaning when Dana White says, I thought you lost, you've already fought for the title and come up short, and you were finished, there's not a lot of indication the UFC is going to get behind him as a contender, to get behind him as a challenger. It's going to be like, look, you had your chance, you came up short. Uh, Not super remarkable. Great fighter, but there's no real pressing reason for the UFC to really get behind him as a contender. So Jan, with his performance over your eye favor, I think kind of leapfrogs both Marlon Moraes and Jose Aldo with his performance. Because when the UFC president says, I thought you lost, that's an indication they're not going to put a lot behind you. It's probably going to get a tough fight next time out, and we'll see where it goes. But a good win for Marlon Moraes. Amanda Nunez over Jermaine Durandamy. Look, for some reason, a lot of criticism. Uh, for Amanda Nunez in this fight, I, I don't know why at all. She dominated completely Jermaine Durandamy. I think the issue is Amanda Nunez as a champion. When you look at her fights with Ronda Rousey, Holly Holm, Cyborg, she set the bar super duper high. If she doesn't knock their teeth out of the octagon, it's considered like, oh, she had an off night. And she admitted herself she had kind of an off night, but I mean, off in what sense? She completely dominated the challenger, wasn't close. Uh, almost ended up in that triangle that ended up a mounted triangle. That was about the only time she was in danger. When I broke this down and I predicted Amanda Nunez to win the fight, the only way I thought Jermaine Durandamy could win is Amanda Nunez starts throwing wild. And by wild, some people took umbrage with the term wild. I don't mean they're reckless punches. She's very accurate with her punches. But she swings with all her power with no hand up on the other side. She just boom, boom, boom. Accurate punches, but they leave a lot of room for a counter striker who really knows what they're doing. So I wasn't insulting her accuracy or her technique or anything like that. My point is when she thinks she has you hurt, it is just machine gun punches. Accurate, strong, powerful punches, but a lot of room for a skilled counter puncher. So I thought if Nunez lost this fight, it would be because Jermaine Durandamy found that counter punching opportunity and dropped her. I think Nunez thought the same thing. The only way I'm going to lose this is if Durandamy really times me and takes me out. So she played a little bit on the feet. You know, Durandamy landed some punches. And she went, nah, let's go to the wrestling and make this basically uh, unwinnable for Jane, Jermaine Durandamy, meaning great ground and pound, physical pressure. I'm strong. I'm big. She doesn't have a lot for me. Now, Jermaine Durandamy did fight comparatively well off her back. The triangle almost got her. Uh, there was another triangle opportunity earlier before that. But... She just wasn't going to catch Amanda Nunez that night. Just not going to happen. So, won a decision uh, in dominant fashion. is 49-45 and 49-44 and 49-46. So, it was one of those where, where she didn't just win. She won almost every round on every single judge's scorecard and had some dominant rounds in there. So, the issue moving forward is, I think 135 as I said in the pre-fight breakdown, is a one-woman show. It's a man in Nunez and everybody else. And I think that showed last night. Interesting uh, thing I read on someone's Twitter, I forget who, but they said a man in Nunez's gift is she finds the vulnerability of her opponent. The vulnerability of Jermaine Duranemi was the ground. That's where she went. 
you know, so she she finds a way to win. She finds what a particular fighter is vulnerable to, and that's her game plan. And that's what she did against her enemy. So I thought it was a very intelligent fight, and it was completely dominant. And what else can you ask? Remember, she's the champ. Whoever she's fighting is the best in the division other than her. So the idea that she can't blow everybody out of the water and knock everybody's head off, okay, well, she's fighting the best in the division. So Alexander Volkanovsky versus Max Holloway. I was straight up wrong on this one. A lot of people were. Alexander Volkanovsky, not only did he have the perfect game plan to take out Max Holloway, he stuck to that game plan throughout the entire fight. That, to me, was the miracle of this one. Was leg kicks, tight boxing, good straight right hand, good countering, decent footwork for five rounds. Max Holloway, as good as he is, as amazing as he is, a lot of the times he's able to, to draw fighters into a brawl. That's what he's able to do. He's able to make it this war of attrition, a brutal slugfest that he is going to win with his range, with his volume, with his pace. Volkanovski never allowed himself to get drawn into that kind of a fight. It was leg kicks on the outside, counter right hands, and lead right hands. But hands high, he's shorter, he's stockier, he presented a small target the entire time. He negated Max Holloway's range, didn't give him anything to hit. Until he was inside, and then he'd throw a quick right hand, and there was no time for Holloway to counter it, any of that stuff. Also, the leg kick to the lead leg, no matter what happened, whether Holloway switched stances or not, brutally effective. Great weapon against a taller guy who boxes. Whenever you have that boxing style, you tend to lean over your, your lead foot, and that's what Holloway does, and he took that lead foot away from him. I couldn't believe... I don't listen to the commentary when I'm studying fights, but I was on Series 6M, and... Whenever the show's about to start, the last 10 minutes, okay, before the show's going to start, we throw on our headset and we do audio checks and stuff like that. So I hear the audio, the UFC's audio feed through the, my headset on SiriusXM. So I caught the end of uh, Volkanovski Holloway. And DC was going, I don't know who won that fight. I, I couldn't believe it. I thought Volkanovski clearly won the fight. And you heard Joe Rogan say, yeah, I hope the judges get it right. He believed Volkanovski won. I thought Volkanovski clearly won. I didn't think it was that close at all. Um, it was interesting because one judge gave it 50-45 to Volkanovski. And you could give Volkanovski every single round. You could. The other two only had it by one round for Volkanovski. 48-47. So, it's funny. One judge sees it as a total blow up. The other one seemed very close. It kind of reminded me a little bit of the first rematch. The first fight at 135 between... Um, Dominic Cruz and Uriah Faber, where they were, Uriah Faber had his moments, but I thought Dominic Cruz won every round. That was kind of this fight to me, where it wasn't a blowout every single round. All right, Max Holloway had his moments, but you could easily give Volkanovski every single round of that fight. So Holloway never able to get into his rhythm, never able to make his jab a factor, never able to get around the leg kicks despite constantly switching stances. And great performance by Alexander Volkanovsky. He said, I don't care about money fights. I want the best in the division every single time. That's a, kind of a, a breath of fresh air. Let's see if he means it. But in the post-fight press conference, I caught a little bit of it. And Holloway said uh, he didn't think he lost the fight. I think he needs to be honest with himself. He lost that fight. He showed a lot of vulnerabilities uh, style-wise. Style -wise. So to me, uh, Volkanovsky, great performance. He's going to be a great champion. Hats off to him. But I was dead wrong on that one. I thought Holloway would win that. I mean, he, he had looked so good before that. But Vol Volkanovski beat him in his prime. Uh, that's the end of an, uh, an historic run for Max Holloway. Kamara Usman, Colby Covington, main event. Great fight. Great fight. Look, here's what I thought. If you watch the pre-fight breakdown. I picked Kamara Usman to win. I thought his power punches would be the difference. I didn't think he would knock Colby Covington out. I thought... He would sting Colby Covington enough in close rounds to win him rounds. That's what I thought. I thought Colby would hit with more volume, but Kamar Usman would rock him at certain points that would win him close rounds. That's what I thought. And that's kind of the way it worked out up until the fifth round. Colby Covington started out smoking, throwing a lot of strikes. Kamar Usman just had trouble dealing with the volume, ate some good punches in round one, I thought at the end of round one, man, it's going to be a long night for Kamar Usman. Because at the end of round one, Colby Covington looked fresh. Kamar Usman looked a little tired. Colby Covington was fighting his kind of fight. Round two, he started slowing down a little bit. I still thought he won the second round. But 
Kamar Usman started landing the right hand periodically, being a little busier. Colby Covington taking a few more breaks. Round three, the tie looked like it was starting to turn. Kamar Usman started landing that big right hand, broke apparently Colby Covington's jaw with that shot. Beautiful right hand. But he started landing hurtful shots on Colby Covington. Started wearing Colby Covington down with some punches. Then in round four, I thought uh, Kamar Usman won that round as well. But Colby Covington was starting to come back a little bit. The tide hadn't completely turned. Colby Covington wasn't waving the white flag. Round four, I thought uh, Colby Covington started coming back. But it was still Kamar Usman's round. I had a tide going into round five. But at the start of round five, I thought Colby Covington's going to win this fight. He came out fresher. He came out throwing more. Uh, Kamar Usman looked a little worn down. uh, Wasn't as busy with his punches. No real attempts at takedowns. I was like, man, he's going to outwork him and win this fight. And then, boom. Kamar Usman turns it around with power punches. Hurts Colby Covington. Drops him twice. And then finishes on the ground while he was trying to get that single leg Iranian position. Underneath Kamar Usman. Look, for people who have an issue with the stoppage, I didn't have an issue with it. Uh, dropped him twice. A lot of people look at that the last five seconds and go, hey, Kobe Cummings is trying to finish that single leg. He should have let him continue. I have a couple thoughts on that. Number one, he had already dropped him twice. The, 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 the finish didn't take place in a vacuum. He had hurt Kobe Covington. He was really rocking him on the feet. Dropped him twice. And then those little hammer punches where, you know, they're hitting him on the side of the head, finish the fight. Number two... Uh, Amy Kaplan, I believe, uh, this morning I saw photos of the scorecards. One judge saw it like I did, two rounds to two, tied going into the fifth round. Another judge had it 3-1 to one, Kobe Covington, and another judge had it 3-1 to one, Kamar Usman. Now, I don't know how you give Kamar Usman one of the first two rounds, but one did. So the point is, had that fight finished, if Colby Covington were able to hang on and not get finished for that last minute, he loses a split decision. Doesn't matter. He doesn't win back that round with the amount of time he would have had left. He's not a power puncher. He couldn't rock Kamar Usman and get the round back or suddenly finish him. He doesn't have that style, doesn't have that kind of physical ability. He would have lost that round and the fight. So you can gripe about the stoppage. And I understand people do looking at it. I mean, he he was still active and still trying to fight. I didn't have an issue with it. But once again, I've, I've talked about this before. There's just a window of judgment for stopping a fight. There is... Oh my God, Mario Yamasaki, this guy's about to die. All right. And then there's somebody stopping it right when someone gets rocked. Right? Right when someone gets dropped, even though they're still capable. There's a gray area all the way through here. And you may think this is too early. You may think that's too late. But anywhere within this window, in that range, I don't complain about it. And I thought this fight was in that range. It might have been on the early side of that range. But it's still in that range of stoppable fight. He'd been dropped twice. So... Even if you disagree with it, he was going to lose a decision anyway. Yeah, it sucks to lose by TKO. It's a little insult to injury. But let's face it. If that round had ended, Kamaru Usman wins round five and he wins the fight. So moving forward, the problem is Colby Covington put a ton behind this fight. He was MF in the UFC. He was MF in Dana White this, this, and that, I'm going to be champ, and I can decide, and I can tell everybody what I'm going to do, and you better pay me, and and he lost. So he's in a bad spot. I think the UFC, they don't cut him, they can still make a lot of money off the guy. I think they give him monster fights, really tough fights from here on out. Colby Covington does not get a title shot again unless he is the only one left. I think they feed him to the wolves whenever possible. The one thing we talked about this morning on SiriusXM, very interesting, R.J. Clifford, my broadcast partner, said, I think they give him Wonderboy Thompson. Because Wonderboy has the kind of style that's usually the kryptonite for a guy like Colby Covington. It's an ugly fight that doesn't make Colby look good. And even if Colby wins, it doesn't do a lot for him. I see that completely. I thought they'd make the Tyron Woodley fight. Simply because there's so much heat behind that fight. They hate each other. It's not an easy fight for Colby Covington. So I still think they want to make money as much as humanly possible off of Colby Covington. And that fight with Tyron Woodley, should Tyron Woodley accept it and everything work out, you know, a lot of things could happen, I think is a big money fight and it's hard for Colby Covington to win. Not that he can't win, but it's, it's, it's no gimme. So I think the UFC is going to give him the hardest fights they possibly can. Hey, you want to MF us? Okay, you're going to have a hard road. And he's going to have a very hard road from, from here on out. Kamaru Usman, another great performance. Uh, he's the king of a very stacked division. Um, who comes up next? Probably Jorge Masvidal. 
I just think that's a big name fight. Uh, sells a lot of pay-per-views. Right now, uh, Jorge Masvidal is red hot. And so I think that makes the most financial sense for the UFC. Does he deserve a title shot over uh, after a win over Nate Diaz? Eh, you could argue he doesn't. I think his wins before that over Ben Askren and Darren Till warrant a title shot way more than the win over Nate Diaz. But it's a very entertaining fight. It makes a lot of money. I'd watch it for sure. And Kamar Usman has fought just about everybody in the top five, if not everyone. So, you know, it, there aren't a lot of, of obvious contenders right now right now for uh, Kamar Usman. So I think Jorge Masvidal is the next one for him. And I think that's going to be a very, very interesting fight. And if it does happen, I'll be here to break it down. So let me know what you guys think. Always appreciate you. And I'll be back before the next one.